This is our Passion Week, the beginning of our Passion Week, right? And this is going to be Palm Sunday. This is Palm Sunday. And there are many significant things. You know, as, as I was reading, you know, um, the, the passage when it comes to this particular event in the Bible, God just really was speaking to me. And uh, I would like to entitle this, this message today, The Entrance of the King. The Entrance of the King. Come on. Amen. The entrance of the king. Everything that we're wanting to do today, especially the big three services today, Good Friday, and Resurrection Sunday, is really to steer you up by way of remembering. To steer you up by way of remembering. I just want to say what Pastor Mylene spoke a while ago, read from Zechariah chapter 9. It's just so powerful. He says that return to your stronghold, right? You prisoners of hope, even today I declare that I will restore double to you. Come on, receive that. That is a word from the Lord. God is ready to restore. He's restoring regardless of what's happening around us. God is restoring double to you. Why? Because we go to that stronghold of hope. That stronghold of hope. Just like what I said a while ago, today is very special. Today, the big three services, today, Res uh, Resurrection Sunday, definitely, and Good Friday. Today, Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and Resurrection Sunday. It is a way for us to co go back and remember so that we are going to be stirred up. Jesus is now headed to Jerusalem for the final time. His earthly ministry is coming to a close, and his teaching ministry upon this earth will be, will be over soon. But with all of these things, most likely, there are many things that are going through his mind and in his heart. He's going to ride into town, not on a stallion, but on a colt, on a donkey. He comes into town not to conquer the Roman government, but to introduce a new kingdom. That's why I want you to go to Matthew 22, verse 1 to 10. And this is where we're celebrating definitely Palm Sunday and this is where we get that passage, the passage for that. Now when, they drew near, when, now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them and immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet saying, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, a, fall, a fall of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and they brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set, them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before them and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? Father, I thank you for your word. And I thank you, Lord God, that you're going to guide us. Thank you for exact words, right words, even, Lord God, impartation. Thank you, Lord God, for encounters with you, even for, especially in these times that we're living in. I thank you, Lord God, that your word is going to transform us. See, for us to see the big picture. Help us to see it, Lord God. Thank you, Holy Spirit, in your name. And all God's people will say, amen, amen. So today we're celebrating Palm Sunday. All right, we're celebrating a monumental location wherein Jesus was entering Jerusalem for the last time. He was entering Jerusalem for the last time. And there are many things that can be taken and as lessons and even revelations from this action, from this moment. But there are three most significant things that we should keep in mind. Three things that really stand out. Are you ready? Number one. Jesus was setting his crucifixion in motion. Jesus was setting his crucifixion in motion. 
It is important to realize that this entry, we call it triumphal entry, is the first time Jesus allowed people to praise him publicly. Think about it. Every time before this, he had forbidden them to not, you know, to not uh, do so, not to praise him publicly, all right, because the time has not yet come. And now what was happening was it was public. He was coming and people were praising him. And do you know what? In the natural, he was allowing, as he was allowing them to praise him, he was bringing the wrath of Rome and even of Judah to him. He was being put, he was allowing himself to be put on a spotlight. And during these times, ladies and gentlemen, this was like all of the people are going up to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. And that is why there were lots of people. And this was the time wherein he chose to enter Jerusalem. Okay, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Now think about that, on a donkey. Now, notice this, that Jesus, this was also the first time that you find Jesus riding a donkey. Most of the time, because I know Jesus, our Jesus, while he was here on earth, he was fit. He was so fit. All right, he was walking, and we've been to Israel. I tell you the topography, you need to be a strong guy to move from one place to the next. All right, but in this particular time, only from where he was to Jerusalem, to enter Jerusalem, it was just close to two miles. Easy for him. But there was something that he wanted to do. He was actually fulfilling a prophecy. What was the prophecy? It was the prophecy of the prophet Zechariah. Zechariah 9.9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. I just want to say that to you right now, wherever you're at. Behold, your king is coming to you. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, on a fowl of a donkey. So this was a particular um, prophecy that he was fulfilling. He was fulfilling. Now, Jesus was deliberate, actually was being intentional, all right? He was deliberate in telling everybody, your king has come. Now, people were thinking about, because of many of history, they were thinking about that this is going to be their deliverance in the natural. They were thinking that Jesus, as he was coming, he was the Messiah, and they, he was the one who's going to overthrow Rome because they were under Rome and the oppression of Rome. But lo and behold, it was not the thing. We know that because Jesus was introducing a new kingdom. Now, as people were getting ready, as Jesus was entering Jerusalem, Jerusalem through the Eastern Gate, people now were declaring, and they're waving palm branches, all right? And they were sh uh, shouting, Hosanna, ble blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna means help me, save me, help me, save me. So they were declaring something they thought in the natural that they will be, Jesus was going to be the deliverer in the natural, but lo and behold, after a few days, these same people are the ones who were cry, are going to cry, crucify him. What is the point of what I'm trying to say here? This teaches me first and foremost, one thing, that God was intentional. God was intentional. God always has a plan. God always has a plan. And not everything you see is what it appears to be. Not everything that you see is what it appears to be. Whatever, wherever we are at right now, we're just like going into easy cue again. It's like it happened a year ago and now we're back. But let me say this, God has a plan. When we trust in Him, He knows our timing. He knows what needs to happen. He has a plan. And that puts confidence in my heart. That puts peace in my heart. And not everything you see is what it appears to be. And so the people were 
thinking that this is going to be Messiah. This is going to be the one who's going to overthrow Rome. But no, lo and behold, he was actually doing something far more than physical salvation. He was introducing a kingdom. Amen? It is important for us to understand that God does not do things haphazardly. He's not reacting. He's not impulsive. God has a plan. He was deliberate. He was deliberate in sending his son. He was deliberate in meeting Nicodemus. He was deliberate in going to Jerusalem for the last time. He was deliberate because he has a plan. I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, God has a plan. Regardless of what we're seeing in the natural today, Jesus has a plan. God has a plan. And no matter what people tell us, no matter what, you know, situations, you know, tell us, ladies and gentlemen, I hold on to his plan. And what is God's plan for you and for me? In Christ, plans to prosper us and not to harm us. Arise, shine, for your light has come, for the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Yes, deep darkness all around, people all around with deep darkness, but the Lord's glory will be seen upon you. That is the plan. Amen? That is why I know He operates according to timing. And now we know we know this, that this pandemic doesn't really come from the Lord, but He can turn this, this, this season around for those who will trust Him. Let me ask you this question. Who is your Messiah? Jesus was coming into Jerusalem. People were declaring, this is my Messiah, this is my Messiah, and they didn't really know the essence of it. But let me ask you right now, who is really your Messiah? In that point that we're living in right now, who is the one who's going to save you? And I know it's Jesus. I know it's Jesus. Amen. That's why we have 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16 to 18. So we do not lose heart. Though our outward self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Pastor Paul does not like this verse. <laughs> but I know, right? Sometimes we see things happening in the natural, but what's happening? Every battle is poised to enlarge us. It's poised to enlarge us. Verse 15, uh, 17, for this light, momentary affliction. Let me say that again. That is so good. In light of this pandemic, for this light, momentary affliction. It's only light. It is only momentary. It is light. And now, let me say this. I am not belittling what things are happening to people. If you lost uh, a loved one, I pray that they know Jesus Christ because they are now in a better place. But in light of God's plan, in light of God's uh, eternity, our eternity, this is only going to be light. This is only going to mo be momentary. Amen. What is, it, this, what is this doing to us as we're trusting in God? It is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comprehension or beyond all comparison. There is a glory after this. Let me say that again. There is a glory after this. After this pandemic, they, the devil has, has, not, has not given us the last say. He's not the last say. Amen. This virus will not be the last say. Jesus, God, because of his plan, he has a plan, and he is the last say. There is glory after this pandemic. Let me say that. There is glory after this. So God is wanting for us to see that the glory that is before us is beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, right? But the things that are unseen are eternal. Amen. That's why it's so important that we trust His plans. It's so important that we trust His moves. He is moving, my friend. He's moving in your family. He's moving in your bodies right now. He is moving on the earth. Regardless of what's happening, regardless of what we're hearing, God has a plan. And what is our part? Our part is to take care of our hearts. Our part is just to take care of our hearts and agree with the flow of God. Amen. Every generation has a role. Our role is to know what the Spirit of God is doing and agree with what God is doing. 
Amen. As we craft our prayers today, we need to know what God wants to do in every situation. That is how we pray under the new covenant. We craft our prayers by understanding what the Spirit of God wants to do in the situation, and we begin to pray along these lines. Amen. What is our part? John chapter 14, verse 27. He told us to guard our hearts. As He will take care of the things around us, He's saying to you, guard your heart. He's saying, peace I leave with you. My perfect peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled. Not let it be afraid. Let my perfect peace calm you in every circumstance and give you courage and strength for every challenge. Amen. As God takes care of the things around us, He's saying for you, first and foremost, to protect your heart. Amen. To protect your heart. What does that mean? To trust in Him. To trust in His plans. To trust in, 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 in His uh, timings. And we rest in Him. We protect our hearts. And He's saying, I will be your defender. I will be the one to take care of you. I will be the one to provide for you. I see your future. It is good. Protect your heart. Amen. Protect your heart. Amen. Do you know they're waving palm branches, right? Do you know the palm tree is really a symbol of victory? Do you know what we do at this time? We lift up our hands, which, which is actually a symbol of the palm. <laughs> we have a palm, right? right? And we wave our hands. Can, can everyone just wave their hands right now? This is a symbol of victory. What do you do when you're in the midst of the battle? You wave your hands. You lift your hands and you wave your hands saying, Hey, Hosanna, the king has come. I have the victory in God. Amen. It's a symbol of our victory in Jesus' name. Second thing that you need to see here, the th second thing that stands out as he enters into Jerusalem, Jesus was offering himself as the Lamb of God that will take away the sins of the world. He was offering himself as the Lamb of God that will take away the sins of the world. Jesus said he came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. All right, here as he was entering, something significant was happening, even in the timing and in the season, in the season and in the time, and even to the day. I want you to go to Exodus chapter 12, verse 1 to 3, and this is the Passover. Are you still okay? Praise God. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. That's so loaded. The beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you and tell all congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. All right? On the tenth of this month. Now, commentary tells us, this is so fascinating, it's a fascinating detail, that the fa Passover was on the 14th day of the month, and this entry of Jesus was actually on the 10th. The 10th day of the month was significant concerning Passover. Why? This is where the, the, the families are beginning to choose a lamb that is going to be sacrificed. Okay, look at verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old, and you may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. So Jesus entered Jerusalem at the point and the place wherein the selection of the lamb was happening. The priest in the temple, they were now selecting the lamb. Wow. They were now selecting the lamb to be offered on that 14th day. He entered on the 10th, and that was the point wherein the priests were so busy doing that. Was that a coincidence? I, I don't think it's a coincidence. All right? Jesus was entering Jerusalem, and he was saying, I am now the lamb. I am the lamb that's going to be slain to take away the sins of the world. This was prophesied actually by John the Baptist. He says, behold, the lamb 
of God who's going to take the sins of the world. As Jesus was riding in, uh, into Jerusalem, the people were crying, Hosanna, Hosanna. Little did they know that the priests in the temple, at the temple, they were now beginning to select the unblemished lamb of, to be sacrificed at the temple. What does that speak to me? Second thing that speaks to me here is God always speaks the language of solution. He always speaks the language uh, of solution. God already has provided the perfect solution for every problem. What that speaks to me was God took the initiative. God took the initiative. At the beginning, the first point that I was making, God was so intentional. He had a plan. The second thing that I want you to see here is God took the initiative. He had the solution already. Do you know that in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, in the New Living Translation, this is so good, God chose him as your ransom long before the world began, but now in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. So Jesus was already committed before the world began to die for you and for me. So the answer before the problem arose was already provided for. Where we're at right now, there is an answer. And the answer is in Christ. The answer is in Jesus. So our salvation was not a spur of the moment decision. All right? It was not a reaction to what was happening. Let me say this. It was not a reaction to what happened to, to, to man because of sin. No, it is actually a revelation of God's love, love plan that was set before time. Right? He was saying that before you were created, God knew what it would cost him to have you spend eternity with him. And he thought you were worth the price. He thought that you would worth the, the price. He saw what's going to happen to man. He committed his son already, but he said, it's worth it. You are worth it, my friend. That's why don't give up. You are worth it. Jesus died at the cross for you so that you will not give up. Amen. So God has a plan. And secondly, we know here that God was the one who took the initiative to provide the solution for you and for me. Before the problem arose, there was already the solution that was given. Amen? And so because of this, he's saying to you and to me, and even if you go to Genesis, you were going to find that he was the first one who actually set the first sacrifice in motion. He was the first one who set the sacrifice in motion. In Genesis 3 verse 21, also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin, clothed them. God did the first blood sacrifice. He provided a covering for Adam and Eve. And that was a foreshadowing of really what's going to happen to you and to me. Amen. Because of the sacrifice at the cross, Jesus, the Lamb of God, is the one who's going to take away the sins of the world. Amen. Whatever problems you're facing right now, there is a solution. Whatever we're going through as a church, as a, as a body, as a world, as a family, or in the world, the Lord has already given us a solution. The solution is in Jesus. The solution is in what Jesus has done at the cross for you and for me. The Lord has gone before us. Let me say that. The Lord has gone before you. He has already prepared the way for you. He watches your back. He's your rear guard, but he already has gone before you. He's the shepherd, right? He's the good shepherd. Amen. And the good shepherd, you know, we listen to the good shepherd. And I want you to go to John 10. And I'm giving you verses upon verses. Why? Because I want to steer you up by way of remembering. Amen. Look at this in verse 10, uh, chapter 10, verse 3. To him the gate keeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Look at verse 4. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them. Ladies and gentlemen, where we're at right now, the Lord has gone before you. The Lord has gone before you. He has gone before me in the days to come. He has gone before me and my family. He's gone before you, church. He's gone before you. And the sheep, 
Look at that. And the sheep will what? Will what? What are we going to do? As he has gone before us, we will follow Lord God, you prepared the way. You opened the way. You prepared the solution. You prepared the protection. You prepared the healing already. Lord Jesus, what am I supposed to do to follow you? For they know his voice. I know your voice. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. He has gone before you. He took the initiative to provide the solution for you and for me already. In Jesus' name. Come on, let's rejoice because of that. Amen? And the last thing that I see here in this triumphal entry is this. Jesus was marching to his death, and he knew it. He knew it. He knew what's going to happen. Jesus was not merely going to sightsee and visit Jerusalem. He's going to die there. He's going to enter Jerusalem, and he, will, he knew it, what's going to happen. He's going to be tortured. He's going to be spit upon. He's going to be beaten. He's going to be you know, tortured at the cross. He's going to be there at the cross. And most of all, he's going to take the sins of the world. You know what really, I was, I was, as I was reading, what really is, think, what he's thinking is, I know that the first time he's going to Take sin. And what's going to happen between him and his father? That there will be a separation. Because he's going to take your sin, my sin, at the cross. And there is going to be what's going to happen. That's why he said, my God, my God, not my father, but my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? Because at that point, Jesus took upon your sin. And the father needed to turn his back at his son. So he was thinking about that. He knew that is going to happen. He knew also that as he went through Jerusalem for the joy that was set before him, he was looking at you and me. He was looking at you and me. Amen. He was looking at this day, you know, March 21. He was looking at, not March 21. What is the day today? March 27. All right. He's, he's, I know he knew that there are people are struggling. People are doubting. People are without hope. He knew. And he wants to provide a solution. He wants to provide the answer in Jesus' name. His desire is to see his father glorified. And his love for us is the one that drove him forward. Let me say that again. His love for you and for me. His love for the father and his love for us is the one that drove him forward. Okay? And when he, the time has come... It arrived. His destination on the earth, the time that he was born, the destination was to be on that hill at the cross to die for you and for me. Amen. Hallelujah. Three things I've seen in this passage, in the, in the triumphal entry. Number one, God has a plan. God was intentional is intentional. Number two, God always provides the perfect solution. Amen. God took the initiative. He was intentional. He took the initiative. And number three, God was deliberate in loving you. He was deliberate in loving you. That's why we have verses like Romans 5, 8, right? For God, but God demonstrated his own love towards us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Come on. Amen. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If God was deliberate, like what I said at the beginning, in taking care of your eternity, why will he not deliberately take care of our temporary? Amen. Hebrews. That's why Pastor Mylene spoke a wonderful message. Choose joy. As we enter EZQ, let's choose joy. Amen. Because Jesus... This is powerful. My takeaway of that, of that sermon last week. Jesus needed to what? Connect to his future so that he could what? Get through his present. Jesus needed to what? Connect to his future so that he could go through his present. What is our future? You know what? Our future is not easy Q. <laughs> it's going to be temporary. We need to go through it. But our future is what? Is set. 
It's going to be glorious. Our future is going to be glorious. That's why don't give up. Don't give up. Don't back down. Don't back off. Continue. Continue to choose joy. Continue to believe because God was intentional. God took the initiative and God was deliberate in loving you. Amen, amen, and amen. And so I want you to see this. I want you to see those three points so that all of us will be encouraged, so that we are going to be stirred up. But one more thing. Do you want some bonus? <laughs> I like bonuses. All right. I like bonus. Bonus. Amen. Jesus, thank you for bonus. <laughs> Amen. Say, thank you, Lord, for some bonus. Amen. Doubled, right? Double in Jesus' name. Double for your trouble in Jesus' name. But you know what? One thing. I, I ask this. Jesus was riding a donkey going to Jerusalem. He did not ride a uh, stallion or a war horse. You know why? Because at this particular moment, he rode a donkey to signify this. In, the, in those times when a conqueror comes into a place and it's a time of war, he rides a war horse. But when a conqueror comes into a particular city and rides a donkey, he comes in, what? In peace. Jesus is telling you and me, I am the Prince of Peace. I come so that you and I would have peace with God. Romans tells us this. Romans tells us in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, in the Amplified, Therefore, since we have been justified, that is acquitted of sin, declared blameless before God by faith, let us grasp the fact that we have peace with God and the joy of reconciliation with Him through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Because He went through all that process. He took the initiative. He was intentional. He was deliberate. He entered into Jerusalem to die. Today, we have peace with God. For those who receive Christ, they now have a revelation of their relationship with Him. Jesus made a way. He said, you have now peace with God. And you know what? Not only that, and later on, in a while, I'm going to ask you, who is your Messiah? Who is your Messiah? Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Because He wants to give peace to you right now. Peace in your soul, my friend. But let me say this. Before I ask you and pray this prayer, there's a second point to this. He comes in in peace. You know why? Because He's going to bring peace to the world. This is a prophetic gesture. We now know in this place that we're living in, there's no peace. In the natural, even in the souls of men. But there will come a point in, in a come, come a day that we're going to see Him face to face. As Jesus, let me hear, hear this. I'm going to wa want you to connect to your future now so that you're able to go to your to your, uh, go through your present. I want you to see your future because one day our king is going to enter Jerusalem again and he's going to be deliberate. He's not going to ride a donkey. He's going to ride a white horse. I want you to see this future, this image, and I want to read from Revelation. And this is your future. This is your future, my friends so that you will know that this is not a coincidental entry. He was deliberate. As he entered Jerusalem, he was deliberate. And do you know what? One day he's going to come back and he's going to be deliberate in entering the same gate, the Eastern Gate. Hallelujah. It says here in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 to 10, And after this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne. Wala nang social distancing. Walang virus dun. This is your future. Right? Standing before the throne. You know what? You and I will be there. We will be there. Before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white clothes. That means of our purity in Him. 
with what? Palm branches in their hands. And crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. This is your future. The people, when Jesus entered, you know, they were doing like a palm branches, but they don't really understand what was happening. For us, the second time Jesus enters Jerusalem, all of us are going to be there and we're going to wave victory, victory, victory. Jesus has conquered and we are there to welcome Him. We are there to welcome Him. This is your future. And I want to end with Revelations 19, verse 11 to 14. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, not a donkey, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire. On, on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in robe and dipped in blood. And by name, uh, the name by which he's called is the Word of God. And look at this, verse 14. Again, we're part of the picture. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. Jesus entered alone, riding on a donkey. When he comes back, enters Jerusalem again in that day. You and I, He's not just going to ride alone. He's going to be riding with us. Riding on white horses, symbolizing that we are the conquerors. I pray that you see this in light of everything that's happening. Connect to your future, my friend. This is only temporary. You know why? God was intentional. God took the initiative. And God was deliberate in loving you. And as we have this, I pray that you will be stirred up by way of remembering and seeing also our future. We have the victory, amen? We have the victory. Can we give praise to Him right now? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. Truly, we raise our hands in worship. We raise our hands in worship. Truly, Lord, we claim our victory. We receive our victory right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For those who are watching right now, I would like for you to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Maybe this is not, the, this is the time we're in. I'm asking if you don't have Jesus in your heart as your Lord and Savior. The people were asking, is this the Messiah? Is this the Messiah? Let me ask you that question. Are you, is He the Messiah of your life? Is He the one that saves you? Is He the one that is going to save you right now? Pray this prayer with me. Jesus the peace giver. He's the one who's going to give you peace in your soul. And whatever is troubling you right now, receive Him as your Lord and Savior. And you're going to have peace with God and peace in your soul. Are you ready to pray? Pray this prayer with me. Pray this, Heavenly Father, that's right. Thank you for what you have done at the cross. I receive your grace. I receive Jesus into my life. Come, Lord Jesus, be the king of my heart. I receive your grace and I receive the forgiveness of all of my sins. Today, I am saved. Today, I have a relationship with you. Thank you. Today, I have peace with you. In your name, I pray. Amen and amen. Come on, we cheer you. We bless you. So good. Amen. If you pray that prayer, tell us right now. Why not type it? I prayed that prayer. I prayed this prayer of accepting Jesus. Or I prayed right now. Just type it and someone is going to, you know, get in touch with you because truly what happened today changed your whole life. Amen. Changed you completely. And so today, I pray that you were blessed by this message. I pray that you were stirred up by way of remembering and also seeing our future. Where we're at right now is only temporary, my friend. God has a plan. God has a solution. And God, you know, took the cross so that you and I would be confident enough so that we can look forward to the future. Amen. Let me bless you. Why not just lift your hands? 
let me just declare a blessing over you. I thank you, Abba. I thank you for your word that steers our spirit up. I thank you, Lord God, that we can choose joy in the midst of these things, the, the things, the things that are happening to us. We can choose joy. And in the midst of this, Lord, we can look to you. I speak to your people right now. I bless you. I declare God's protection upon you. I declare God's hand upon you as you know that God was intentional, took the initiative and deliberate that you will know the days to come, tomorrow and the days to come, that you are protected in His hand. He is deliberately protecting you, healing you, loving you. He will take care of you because you have a good future in Him. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord makes His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord shines His favor and grace upon you and give you peace. Shalom. Nothing missing, nothing broken. I say no COVID-19 is able to touch you and your family. And if you are infected in Jesus' name, quick recovery and healing upon your body right now in Jesus' name. We receive it by faith. And all of us who believe it say amen and amen. God bless you, everybody. We'll see you again next time.